Hello, everyone. Hope I'm audible. Yes, Jyotsna. Thank you, ma'am. Greetings for the day and very warm welcome to today's webinar on network-based approaches to explore the biological data hosted by Department of Computer Science, Maitri College, University of Delhi, India. I, Dr. Jyotsna Vasan, on behalf of the Department of Computer Science, Maitri College, extends special welcome to our esteemed speaker, Professor Hiri Jane Zeng, who is from School of Computing, University of Ulster, United Kingdom, and patron and chair of this webinar, Honorable Principal of Maitri College, Dr. Haritma Chopra. Friends, modeling and analysis of complex systems using network-based approaches showing different connections have been the object of study for a long time. They have caught attention in many disciplines such as sociology, ecology, psychology, and biology. Network-based approaches for biology have extensive applications. Network theory is an efficient tool to model biological networks such as gene co-expression networks, protein-protein interaction networks, or pathways. Considering the enhanced resolutions of complex real-world systems, the interest now has been directed to multi-layered networks. The exploitation of the emerging network-based approaches to medicine enables multiple potential biological and clinical applications by offering an intuitive and reliable way to explore the molecular complexity of a disease and thus leading to identification of disease genes as potential drug targets and biomarkers. They may prove even very useful to develop pathological model of today's pandemic COVID-19 and much more. Today, Professor Jane will enlighten us on this topic, and I would like to introduce you to her. She is a professor of computer science with School of Computing, Ulster University, United Kingdom. She is a full-time member of Computer Science Research Institute at the Ulster University and a fellow of UK Higher Education Academy. She was awarded a PhD in Computer Science Applied to Bioinformatics in 2003 and a postgraduate certificate in teaching in higher education in 2005 from Ulster University. Professor Zing is an active researcher in bioinformatics and healthcare informatics. Within her broad interest in data mining, data integration, machine learning, and healthcare support systems, she has a research interest and expertise in integrative data analytics in the fields of systems biology and intelligent data analysis and assistive technology to support healthcare and independent living. She has a successful track record of winning research fundings as a principal investigator and has been a grant holder of prestigious research projects funded by EPSRC, TSP Dell, NHS UK, Invest Northern Ireland, and European Commission, including smart self-management platform for connected health, cardio workbench, SenseCare, and Metaplat. The products of her research have been reflected in over 230 peer-reviewed journal and conference pub publications with over 2,000 citations. Professor Jane is a senior member of IEEE. She serves on the editorial board of several international journals and serves as co-chair and program committee members of several international conferences. We are so lucky to have you here, Jane. On a personal note, being her PhD student in Ulster University, I really wish to acknowledge her for her research skills and all competencies. Now, I would like to request Principal of Maitri College, Patron and Chair of the session, Dr. Haritma Chopra, to please inaugurate the webinar with her enlightening words. Over to you, Dr. Haritma. Thank you so much, Jyotsna. I hope I'm audible. Am I yes, audible? Yes, yes, perfectly fine. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Jyotsna. Uh, on behalf of Metre Fraternity, I extend a very warm welcome to Professor Jane and all the participants of this webinar. I can see that the number, it has already more than 70 people have joined and we are expecting that soon more people would be joining in. And at this moment, I hope and I pray that you all and your loved ones are safe and comfortable during these challenging times. 
because we understand that the entire world is grappling with pandemic covid-19 and at this moment because uh, when we talk about different webinars it has been observed that across world there has been a seamless flow of knowledge information and we have been believing now in collaborative learning and organization of such webinars is one such example and when we talk about specifically this time we know that when we organize different webinars we have been talking about because of covid uh, the focus has been on mental health also we have been talking about that we are experiencing mood swings so people might go in depression also so there are so many things which are happening and we say that these are the side effects or the consequence of the pandemic which we are observing now but if you actually look at the root cause of these we know that when we talk about mental health we talk about mood swings these are somehow i personally feel and i hope you all would agree to it that we these swings these mood swings are certainly not monitored only by ourselves our brain but the actual the pers- the thing organisms which are responsible for all these things are tiny microbes and microbes which we can't even see through our naked eyes but they are actually the driving system of our human body because our human body is a host of so many millions of microorganisms and when i talk about microorganisms we are primarily focusing on bacteria and it is because of these bacteria only that the humans they come across they and they have to go through different types of diseases and when we talk about whether it is asthma where, whether this is obesity whether it is diabetes somehow these are all governed by microbes and when i talk mm-hmm. about microbes it becomes very difficult to understand that how because in case of humans we we, we have been talking that the genetic information is mm-hmm. stored in form of dna and mm-hmm. rna i think the similar thing even the genetic material of microbes is governed by is stored in the form of dna and rna and because of this only it becomes very important for us to understand the functional structures how these things help us but when i look at the data which is around us maybe it is very difficult because sometimes these microbes they are present in such small amounts maybe in parts per million parts per billion that sometimes it becomes very difficult to even cultivate these in the laboratories and when we can't do this but we know that in order to understand in order to make the survival of mankind more uh, more comfortable more during these challenging times we certainly need to have some other methodologies by which we can understand these microbes their ecosystem and so that we are able to come up with proper treatment against these when we talk about microbes when i'm saying proper treatment against these means i'm talking right now about those microbes that are causing some diseases they may cause some infection in the body because there are many microbes we always say that there are good microbes there are bad microbes because some these are very essential for our very existence also so when we are talking about these since it is not possible to cultivate every strain in the laboratory so the role of information technology the computer tools mathematics and statistics becomes very important and it is because of this i personally feel that bioinformatics have come up as a big field now because this is the current area of research and if we go one step forward because when we say that using these tools we have to analyze the biological data and since biological data when i am talking about then we know that it is available in the environment and this, since these are all living organism i understand and we feel we certainly all would agree that the presence of one microbe can certainly affect the community of other microbe also 
so it means it is at the same time it becomes very important for us to analyze these microbes in the environment also when we talk about the environment samples means we are talking about metagenomics so whatever data through metagenomic data that we are obtaining that can be understood only with the help of bioinformatic tools and when we talk about all these things at this moment i am very happy to share with you all that methrai college because in our college we have always laid focus emphasis on research and imparting skills to our students making them aware of the current areas of research and what is happening around them so last week last month only the college had collaborated with the industry and we have started with a certificate course in metagenomics bioinformatics and uh, this is one certificate course and i am very happy to share with you professor jain that on this monday only 85 students that was the first batch who have successfully completed this course so this is how we feel that we at methrai which is a constituent college of delhi university we are also making a small contribution but i personally feel that there is lot to be learned lot to be explored and this is just the first step and when we move forward maybe we would be looking for more such opportunities and i am so happy that you have accepted our invitation and you would be delivering your talk because i personally feel that this talk is just the beginning because this is your field of research and even the students in my college they are very keen to explore and learn a lot so maybe in times to come we would be having more such platforms where two of us we would be collaborating and we would be putting our uh, maybe maybe we would be there to contribute to make a small contribution also towards the research that is being conducted by you and your laboratory and your students and i am sure you would be very happy with jyotsna because uh, jyotsna is the representative of methrai college and she has been with she was with you for the past 3 years more than 3 years and you have learned, you must have observed through her also that the culture that exists in methrai college and i am very happy that you accepted our invitation and you are here to deliver your thoughts your concerns with us so on behalf of methrai college i again extend a very warm welcome to you and i am sure that all the participants they would be having they would be taking away more things and maybe they would be more enthusiastic after this session to learn about this emergency so thank you so much thank you jyotsna for giving me this opportunity and once again i welcome professor jane for this webinar thank you so much thank you so much for your valuable words dr haitna really means a lot and truly agree that microbial communities are indis indispensable and uh, we need to look into those and develop some computational models to deliver good research and analyze that yes we can beat some day some day we can beat covid 19 as well now i invite professor jane to introduce us to network based approaches to biological data analysis so over to you professor jane uh jane you are not audible i think you need to unmute yourself
Yeah, can you hear me now? Oh yes, perfectly fine. Then now, thank you so uh, much. Okay, sorry. I'm I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. So can you see my screen now? Yes, Jane. Yes. Good. Okay. So firstly, thank you very much for the invitation. And I think I owe a few thanks to um, to the university and to the um, Metri College. Firstly, I would like to thank you very much of um, sending Joshina over to Austria because she has been so good, um, a, such a good contribution to our team and to the project. So thank you. And as um, Dr. Um, as Dr. Haritam and Chopra said, and she really, through her, we really see the quality and all the, um, not just research quality, but also the personality, the good, all the good merit of um, st staff members from your university, your college, and then indeed from um, India country as well. So um, believe or not, my supervisor in for my PhD was also from Derry from India. So that's really good. And I have to say thank you. And then also thank you for the invitation. It's really a big honor, a great honor to accept and to have the invitation. And then and I can see I'm really looking forward to see for the future, you know, more um, collaboration, more work and more communication um, with you as well. And then thank you for Dr. Harry and to organize all this. And thank you, Joshna, for organize all that. Okay, so um, this is going to be a big adventure for me to do the um, seminar via the Google Meet um, meeting because I've never done that before. Um, so hopefully the lines or the connection stays in the following remain section. So, and today I'm going to talk about um, the network-based approach to exploit the biological data. So firstly, and um, because um, maybe a lot of you haven't been to Northern Idem. So firstly, I would like to introduce Northern Idem. So Ulster University is based in Northern Idem in the UK. So in Northern Idem, there are some very beautiful, famous thing. And so I put some picture here. So the first picture here is Titanic Museum. Um, everyone knows about Titanic, and but very few people know it was built in Belfast. And this museum, the height of the museum is exactly the height of the Titanic ship above water. Okay, and that's wonderful Giant's Causeway, those big nature stones, and this one of the word um, his teach. And then the loop bridge, a very old low bridge connected to islands. Now the last picture, maybe some of you recognize that if you are watching Game of Thrones, you may recognize that. And this is the King's Load in Game of Thrones. And it's Dark H. So those trees over um, 300, 500 years old. So it's a beautiful um, country and beautiful place. And really welcome you to come to visit us sometime when this coronavirus go. So that's um, our university. So Austin University has four campus. Korean campus, McGee campus, Belfast campus, and Jordanstown. We are based in Jordanstown, and we are going to move to Belfast city center um, next year. Hopefully, I don't. It may be postponed because of this pandemic. Okay, so we're based in Jordanstown, and that's where Georgina has 
had been with us in the past few years. And these are the column, uh, um, column view or pictures from Jordanstown campus. So that's the Jordanstown campus, the library entrance, and you can see very quiet because of no student there. Um, but just want to tell you that it's really a green, a green um, place and beautiful place and quiet as well. Even when students come back, it's normally quiet. Okay, so um, very quickly and talk about my research areas. And I think um, in the introduction, I'm the Dr. Um, Chopra and Dr. Zhang has already have already kindly introduced um, some of that. So just quickly talk about. So my my main research area, all my groups' main research area, focus on the artificial intelligence and data analytics, and we mainly looking at two areas. So first uh, application area is on bioinformatics and systems biology. So try to understanding, try to understand the data in systems biology, and mainly focus on network-based approaches in recent years, which looking at how to construct net, how to construct um, biological network, how to identify the functional modules and dynamic dynamics of the network, and especially looking at multiplex network, how that could be applied into solve those um, problem. And the other part of application is on healthcare informatics. So we focus on how to use assistive and living technology to support independent living for home-based delivery of telecare or healthcare and how people can self-manage their conditions and recent year, we, we put a lot of efforts on two areas. One is the gate analysis, and the other one is the care robotics system. And so this other uh, overview of um, our group uh, research. And for today, of course, we are not going to cover, we won't be able to cover all of this. So today we're going to focus on the network-based approach. So. I'm going to talk about um, the network-based approach into some application and use some case studies or some research work to explain how we use that, okay? So network-based approach, it originates from graphic theory. And the main thing we applied the, or the rationale for applied network-based approach is the assumption is that diversity, diversity um, or diverse information from different aspects are normally connected, interacted, especially for the biological um, system or our health system. So the interactions existing, they are not isolated. So for computer science, that's a big challenge is how we can identify, how we can understand those complicated or complex interactions. And then from them, how we will be able to derive the knowledge we need. So when we talk about the biological network, um, it's not new, it has been there for years, especially, for example, when people talk about the protein-protein interaction network, gene regulatory network, or metabolic network, signal networks. So all those are normally very often represented as network because of the interaction, they are not isolated, okay. Um, where we have been applied the network-based approach to is we use that to construct biological network to identify the functions, functional modules from the networks. For example, to identify the um, functional proteins 
all the functional genes that contribute to a particular biological function. And to investigate the dynamic of biological networks. So for example, in metagenomics, how those um, metabolite, how those um, microbials change over the time, how those metabolites change over the time. And then we use that to identify the disease subtypes and for the similarity disease detection and, and so on. So for all those, there's one key thing in that is for biological data, there are not just one single type of data. They have different type of data. So the integrative data analysis, analysis is the key. And network-based approach is able to bring different data in and to, to integrate them and to provide a more comprehensive, comprehensive um, analysis. So as I mentioned earlier, for the biological data, they can come from their different types. So normally, we can separate them into, or we can um, categorize them into two different type of um, multidimensional data. So one is the multiple, one is the multiple um, sources of data. So we can have the multi-omics data ranging from the genes and proteins and up to the um, phenomics. And then we can have clinical data, which is very key because we're in the health or in the systems medicine. And we have um, a lot of um, clinical data. In recent years, when people move from the medicine towards to more integrated healthcare, then lifestyle played a very important role in all this global healthcare. So lifestyle data also a lot have a lot. So it can be it can be your eating, your and your diary eating, your physical activity, your sleep. And so all those, that's important. And then in addition to those um, data that we can record, there's also other data that we may not be able to measure, but experts they have. So those are prior knowledge. So how we be able to incorporate all these different types of data into the network analysis. That's challenging. And on the right hand side of this slide, we're also looking at data from different time and spatial scale. And you can come from the different um, or, um, different level of the um, systems. So from the cellular level and, and then to to the tissue, to organ. And you can also come in from the different um, time as well. Okay, so for example, one of um, my PhD students is looking at the data from the um, agriculture area. So the data from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and five years ago, and now how those animals, cows, their behavior change, their eating, their genes, all that's change. What's the difference? Okay, so these are the multidimensional biological data and researchers uh, have been working at and it's quite challenging. Now, coming back to the network-based approach, so very quickly, um, I think most of you may already have that, uh, already know that and so I'm going to go over those some of the slides a little bit quicker okay so if we talk about if we look at a single layer network and from the graphic theory 
um, point of view, it can be present as a set of nodes and edges and link them together. And for the single layer network, and it can be represented as a tuple. So have the nodes and edge and a graph link that. And the edge, of course, it represents the connection. And those connections can be different. It can be undirected and it can be directed. And you can also add in some weight to that. So the network could be undirected network, direct network, or weighted network. And, and then how to identify how to decide if those two nodes are connected or not. And that would be, they have, they have different methods to do that. And we will talk about some of that or mention some of that later. Okay. So when we put those on single network together, and normally what we do is we take the different um, data in, and those different data can be from different data source, or it can be just from the same data source, but looking at the different features of the data and construct the network. After construct the network, you can do some um, standard type of network analysis. For example, you can look at the centrality analysis and you can do the topology topological clustering, and can use the shortest path analysis, etc. And one of the key things is uh, a lot of uh, research then also focus on the motives identification. So for example, you can also use, you can try to find out a functional module and to see if that's the set of um, genes or proteins or some biomarkers that contribute to a specific functions. So that's the high level of concept. And then recent years has been moving towards to more of towards to the multi multi-layer networks. So for multi-layer networks, basically you can look at the network at multiple layer. All the network at different layer, at least they were shared different multiple ages. Okay, so by doing by adding one more concept of layer, then the network representation changed from a tuple network to a quadruplate network, and so you're adding one more of the layer here. So for each layer, you still have the nodes and age, but with more than one layer and they can, the nodes or can communicate, okay? They will have different nodes as well. And of course, the single layer network, if can be viewed as a specific, um, specific one um, for the multi-layer network. Now, the other concept um, that we use is the multiplex network. So for multiplex network, um, it's a specific type of multi-layer network, as we can see, it also contains different layers. And the key difference is um, the, for the multiplex network, we tend to think that for the nodes in different layers, they are all the same. So for example, if we are looking at a uh, stratified medicine or positional medicine, and we want to look at the, we want to look at different patients. So each node in this network can represent patients. So the patients are the same, okay? So each node will be the same patient. So this node and that node will be the same patient across the network. But then at different layer, they may have different um, data coming. So for example, they may be from the lifestyle data, environmental data, and this one will be symptoms, and those will be maybe genomics and data. From different type of data, construct a network. 
and integrate them together and then to identify the different type of treatment. So that's the concept of the multiplex network. And main thing is we normally use the first one, which is each node are the same across the layer. But some people also would use the second um, definition that if two layers share some nodes and they also think that would be the multiplex network. So as I said earlier that we have a, been applied um, this to a few different um, application. So in this talk, we're not going to go over all of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, four examples and to introduce the work that we have done. Um, and just to see how that could be used. And hopefully then they will um, give some ideas. So the first um, case study um, I want to talk is um, a private network, um, actually complex network to identify cancer subtype. So the, um, of course, we all know that's quite um, can cancer. It's a key challenge. It's still not curable, but treatment is quite important. And even for the same type of cancer, the treatment should be different because patients' response to the same treatment are different. Okay, so it's very important. Then we need to understand the subtype. Even for same cancer, identify the subtype so that we can know how we can provide mm -hmm. optimal patients trifide and to provide the treatment to them. So the approach we use is the multiplex network. So what we are doing, uh, what we try to do is we try to set up, establish a flexible network. And this flexible network means that when we have the patient in, so the patient will have data from different data source, okay? So we would look at, we would use one type of data, construct a network to see how, for example, microarray data come in, and we calculate the similarity. Now this pairwise, um, patient-wise and similarity, that's the, calculation of the similarity that will give us the the way to connect those nodes together. So that's to determine the age. So compare the similarity and we established one network and for the other data coming establish another network. The beauty of this is when there are more data coming and this network can be expand, it's flexible, okay? It can be scaled up. And after connecting this, after construct this network, then we will look at how to, we will look at how to coupling these, those network together. So by coupling those network to, together, basically then you link all the different layers network into one big network and we'll be able then to use the clustering analysis to identify the set. So that's the overall concept. So just going to present some mathematics there. Okay. So as I said then, the SKR that represent the similarity network from the different data set and each node represents the patient, each age represent the similarity between the patients. So um, although those are for illustration only, but even that we can say, for example, these two patients, their MI, RNA are quite different, but they have very similar of um, DNA methylation, for example, okay? And the omega um, ISK that represent the coupling strength between two networks or two layers or two slides, 
Okay, so that's the representation, the concept. And for after we have built up the network, so to now I'm not going to go into the details of those. Okay, so that's the quality um, metrics we use. So from that, basically looking at the adjacent metrics and then use the adjacent metrics and look at the strength between the network and then to calculate the qualities, okay? And after calculate all this, then we can implement the network and we can use, so I'm going just to for the for the overall approach, high level one. Okay, so if you want to go for more details, you can look at our paper. So after you construct the network and we calculate all the um, ejection matrix, and then we can then establish a, major, a majority matrix. Okay, so for the majority, that's one example. So for the um, category complex network, and for we establish the modularity matrix. So this one, the first one could be from the first slice of the network and or the first data source. And the second one is from the second um, network. And the third one from the third layer of the network. Then use the um, adjacent, adjacent matrix to link them and to, to establish each layers. And then use the um, interslice coupling strength to coupling them together. So that's the big um, modularity matrix. After we establish the modularity matrix, then we'll be able to do to run the um, clustering and to detect the community. Okay, so we applied this method into the re, into the um, cancer data. So we take the data from the um, TCGA website, and that con that contains of three types of um, genomics data, so DNA methylation, mRNA, and miRNA expression, so have different genes, yeah. And then you also, it's very important that you're very useful, you also contains the patient's information data, so have the patient's age and survival time, etc. And that's quite useful to see how the treatment, how the response would be. We applied the methods and we start from change the width or the strength of the coupling strength. So of course, when the coupling strength is set to zero, which means three layers have no connection, yeah, then there are three subtype, okay? But then when we increase the coupling, sorry, there are three um, separate layer. When we increase the coupling strength, and then you start to, in, to increase the connection of those three different types of data. And eventually then we will be able, when, when we increase that to zero point, um, when we increase that to 0 0.3, um, and we will be able to identify the three subtypes, okay? And the process of doing that is you try to increase the omega value, and you have the bigger one, a bigger number of subtype, and you try to then merge them into the smaller one, and you gradually introduce that. And now, of course, there is one question is, when do you know how you stop that? And to, when you want to stop that, then you, you will need to introduce another measurement, just like the clustering um, index, etc. So you want to make sure that the 
clusters you find they are um, close enough and separate enough as well okay so we identified three subtypes and have different um, map that to different patients now these three subtypes are based on the three genomics and, and mr genes data and mRNA data, et cetera. And then we map that with the patient data to see, evaluate if the result is good or not. Okay, so if we map those three um, data source into the, for the subtypes, and it's very interesting. If we look at the DNA methylation, we find the connectivity is very good. Okay, if we look at the data from the um, mRNA data, and you can see the interaction in interconnection is quite good. But then if we look at the mRNA data, you can't really tell anything. So which means that an individual data from one individual data source, it's not easy to identify the subtype. So really, only when they combine together, for the um, multi-press network, then you'll be able to identify that. And from the results, then we map our three subtypes to the clinical data. And it's very interesting, then you can find that subtype two, it's very close. If we look at to the age, subtype two, it's really close associated to the younger patient. And if we look at the survival time, and it's also no surprise that patients in subtype two have longer survival time. They are younger, yeah. So now, as we said, it's more important to see the treatment. And so we look at the treatment response for the drug of um, temozolumide. And we look at the three subtypes. Now it's in, it's very interesting for subtype one and three, they have sig signif significantly increased the survival time. But for subtype two, there's no significant difference. So which means if this patient is a subtype, had subtype two cancer, then this treatment not really make things different. So we should look at a different treatment for this type of patient. So this is very important because that's not just for to improve the treatment, but also in some countries, it can save a lot of money for the patient and the family as well. Okay, so that's one example of how we use the multi network approach for the for the um, stratified medicine. Okay, so the highlights here is that you can, that you, it's, you can provide a flexible platform. And when you have different data in, you can be scaled, yeah? And then also you reveal some more information than other traditional methods. And for example, like just using one single type. So I'm now going to move to a second case study. So for the second case study, we're looking at the multi-layer network again. So we apply that to the similarity disease detection. And this paper was, um, I think it's online now, published online now. So for this, we mainly want to understand the similarity the similarity between different disease and what caused that, okay? And this work will be quite useful, um, I have to say. And we are looking at to extend this work to the um, COVID-19 virus detection, although the subtype for COVID-19 is also useful. And I, I'm sure that you are all aware that they have identified ABC, different subtype of COVID-19. And 
this work of the similarity disease is also very interesting. So we are looking at how to apply the method to the new um, challenge. And so in this work, we use a representation learning method for the disease information network. Now for the represent Representation learning, that's more of the standard um, machine learning, one of the sta machine learning methods. So I'm not going to focus that much, but I'm more focused on the concept, the idea of how to, how to put the network together. Okay. So the main approach of this divided by three steps. The first step is the single layer. This is similarity network construction. And then after construct a single layer and then move to the multi-layer um, network construction. Then after that, I use the random work clustering um, to do the clustering. Um, after that, of course, then using the uh, rep representation learning for the similarity similarity query or the checking. Okay, so now first step is for the single layer network construction. Again, for the each disease, they have different um, data related to the disease. So have the protein data, have the chemi chemical compound data, have the gene data, yeah. So for the different data, and we try to and then um, from the different data and different disease, and we try to construct the disease information network. After a disease information network construct and start to measure the similarities. Now, remember I said earlier of, um, of how to calculate, how to determine the age and that's, that's related on how you calculate, how you measure the similarity between the nodes, okay? So um, now in this work, we use two type of similarity and combine that together um, to construct the similarity network. After the similarity network, the similarity um, combined, and we will be able to construct a single layered network, okay? And then coupling them together. So just start from the disease information network. So for the disease information network, as you can see, it's represent just one single network, okay? So that's from the different disease related biological data type, put that in together and you can construct that. And for the similarity network, then we want to look at the similarity. So for the disease, if we, when we have the disease information network, those information that we can take in, as we can take from the data, database, we know which you can calculate um, for this part, you can calculate which one are linked together, if they have any relationships, okay. Now then, when you link them together, it's important to measure the similarity matrix. So there are two types of similarity matrix we use. One type is the meta path based similarity. So look at from the disease one, for example, from disease one to disease two, the meta path adds through G1, yeah. And to D6, that's G1 as well, and to D3, you have go through the path here, or you can go through the path there, or a third path. Okay, so that's the meta path. So you, you can use that to measure the similarity. And the second, the second similarity is the neighborhood-based structure similarity. So you look at, you can look at the neighborhood. So for example, we look at disease five, and you can look at the neighborhood, okay? So they have connection with 
one type, one protein and two chemical compounds and one gene. And then you can look at the other, you can look at the other disease and you find a, you find a structure, the neighborhood structure, then of course you will be able to say these two diseases are more similar. But then if you look at the other one, the other disease, then you will find it's more dissimilar. Okay, so that's um, use these two similarity now, similarity, then you'll be able to construct a single layer network and to coupling that together. Now, I'm going to just to quickly talk about when you coupling that together, how you apply clustering algorithm to that, okay? So in this um, work, we use random work approach. So how you, how you, how you will be able to random work on the different, on the multi-layer network. Now, I don't know um, how many of you have used random work approach before, but just very quickly to explain for the random work, normally you can start, um, have a starting point and you look, you look at the um, adjacent, you can calculate the property and to see from this point and which one so the workers should travel to, okay? So on the, and you will travel to a, the next node and calculate the similarity and travel again. And, and here you get to the iteration, you identified a clusters. That's on one single layer, single network. Now, when we do that cross the multi-layer network, it's similar. The difference is, for example, if the worker is at here, when he wants to travel, so he will calculate the calculation of the property. It's not just on this network, okay? So you will calculate the property, also the connection with the other network, the other layer of network. And so that you can jump, you can walk from this, network to the other network. It's just like when you walk on the street, you can walk, travel to the, turn to different junction. But sometimes you may find a bridge, then you will find, yeah, it's a better path. So I'm going to cross the bridge. Okay, so you can cross the bridge to the, to the other network and you can cross that again. Okay? So that's how random work on the multi-layer um, network works. And so we apply the, um, this approach to the um, C CTD data set and we were, and for two different type of data and we've, we've been able to identify the similar disease and this similar disease. So the main um, highlight of this work, as you can see from that, and for all those study, the data we use earlier, we didn't use ontology. It's an ontology independent network. So when you have the data in, you will be able to do, to do the calculation. And then um, it will be very interesting to apply this research to look at other disease, similar disease that um, with COVID-19 Okay, and we also extend this work into the gene similarity explanation because when we look at gene similarity, I mean, it's more important. It's not just to identify the genes are similar or not, but one, it's more important to see, can you explain, explain the similarity? So for example, for the genes, um, for those two genes, then, they have different information related to the genes. Now, how to explain why those genes are similar, why they are here. So we ex use the similarity network to do um, for the analysis. So this um, work has been submitted and it's under review. So it's a, one of the recent work. So in the first two case study, 
I'm talk about the um, medicine or healthcare type. And the next two study, we're going to more to look at the aquaculture, the microbial um, research. So this is the work also um, that Georgina has also helped um, support some part of this um, work. So this work is funded by uh, European Commission. So we look at the methane emission and we look at the nutrition to the aquaculture, the cow. So to see how we can, how we can in, improve the feed conversion efficiency and how we can reduce the methane emission so that um, we can help to improve the aquaculture and protect the environment. So that's the both arms. Of course, there are other two arms, the animal health and meat quality. Now we haven't looked at those two yet. Okay. And so we mainly look at microbial data. So from the for the microbial and genes, and we want to look at for the which type of genes they are, they played more important role to the feed conversion efficiency. So which means if you if farmer give the animal or the cow less food or the same amount of food, they can gain more milk or more meat. And, and then for the methane, they can reduce, they can produce less methane because methane contribute um, a lot to the global um, warming, the green, green gas issue. Okay. So we applied um, the network analysis and being able to identify the set of genes relate to those and um, two functions. However, when we look at closely of the results, we find there's one issue in construction the network. So in when we construct the network, in this case is the co-abundance network because we use the abundance, okay? When we construct the co-abundance network, there's one key issue is what's the threshold, the correlation threshold to use? So correlation is used as the similarity to link the two nodes together. And before it was manually set to 0.9, but this is quite subjective. The question is, can we make this threshold more objective? Now I just use this um, case study as an example to show how you can improve the network and what you can look at. So threshold is one, a small thing, but it can make quite big difference, okay? So for, in this work, we look at that, we will see, we look at that the correlation matrix and we think it can be break into two part. One will be high correlate and one will be weak correlate, yeah? So for the high correlate, that will be, that will be change, you know, and the correlation specific to the change in conditions and the weak one may be no specific changes between the gene abundance. Now to determine, to decide the best one, and we went back to a VO theory, random metric theory, it's more mathematic theory. That's already 50, more than 50 years old. So the theory basically said, based on two universal prediction associated with statistical properties, of the nearest neighbor spacing distribution of unfold um, eigenvalues. So if we look at those two, um, the, the different distributions, it says that if for any random matrix, if they close, closely follow the Gaussian um, orthogonal assembled statistics, then that would be the random, 
okay? And for non-random metric, then they will follow the Poisson distribution. So that's uh, a very interesting because we want to make sure that the changes we get, the value we get, um, it's not uh, just a random select threshold, okay? So how we do that is then we calculate all the, um, the change, we calculate the um, NSD, and then we look at the changes when the distribution change from the Gaussian distribution to the Parson distribution. And we've, when this distribution started to change, and that's the threshold we take. Yeah, so we taken the threshold and at the end for the study, we've identified the threshold actually to be 0 0.99. So then we take this threshold and then we use that to establish the core abundance network. And of course, take into the domain knowledge of the cake pathway and trace specific genes, etc. establish the network. Um, after establish the network, then we can do the topology analysis. We can analyze the, we analyze the bi biological relevance and we analyze the functional enrichment. So it can be gene enrichment, it can be pathway enrichment. Okay, so we apply this approach to look at the um, microbial um, genes and we then being able to establish the core abundance network and use the abundance network and we can do the um, analysis and we identified like the module B, it's, that's the red one and it's associated with the methane emission and module C then have all the genes that associate with the microbial um, genes. Now that seems quite um, quite good, but it's not stopped yet because the result is very good and we publish the result and we closely analyze the results from biological point of view and then we find there are two issues. There's no difference between positive and negative correlation. And the composition, compositional effects in the analysis um, of the relative abundance data are still there. So to further step, to overcome that issue, then we go back to the similarity measurement. Now that's again going back to the similarity measurement. So we look at different type of similarity measurement metrics. Ma yeah. And then for all those different type of, so we use the different type similarity metrics and we will be able then to include, we'll be able then to include the, um, to run the genes and to include the top genes and bottom genes for the analysis. And that's for the permute. So in the previous um, method, we adding this permutation analysis and we look at the results and the rest of them then will be the same. Then after doing the, after revisit, introduce this, um, similarity metrics, then the results improved um, better and the funding it's more biological sound. And we then moved, we, we have um, published this paper in 2018. So it's more, um, it's, it's the results much better. So then and the highlight of this case study, I would like to say is when we constructed that work, then you really need to think of the details. That's first step, that's the network you construct is, what about the quality of the network you, you construct? Does it ex expect the highly modular structure? And then also the network you construct, does, do they in, contains the core 
um, co-presence or mutual exclusion patterns? And have you looked at the comp compositional effects? Okay, so will you be able to mitigate that? So you just need to, that's back to one is your, the machine learning or the computational method you analyze. Does you, do you introduce any bias results because of you didn't consider the um, information or the analysis um, completely? So just try to reduce those. And the reason we were able to do that is we have um, the biologist in the team, so they will be able to provide the comments, okay? So finally, that's the final, I know I may run out of, yeah, I hope I'm, it's not um, over time too much. So that's the final um, case study. So this final case study, it's uh, a current ongoing um, work that um, another PhD student is currently doing. So I try to integrate prediction of the cattle and phenotype. I try to look at the, not just the genomics data, but also the metabolic biometrics data and look at the diet and methane both as well. Okay, so the new thing um, in, this PhD project is to get the metabolic text information. So the idea, again, we want to use the network-based approach. So look at the co-abundance co network, taking the metabolites and into those integrals, and some are unknown, and into to identify the new, to identify the Motorbrides. And we also look at the microbial genes to establish the, ne the abundance network. And then look at the microbial community level at the microbial community, community level to combine that together to establish another core abundance network. Um, after that, then combine those network at different um, into the multi-layer or multiplex network to identify those key interactions. So that's the overall research. So currently um, we have um, just submit one paper on looking at the heat, a heat diffusion multi-layer network approach to identify the functional biomarkers in lumen methane emission. Okay, so for that, um, I'm just going to go through those a little bit quicker, okay? So we look at the, construct a different concurrence um, network, and then construct, after the different concurrence network construct, then construct them into a multi-layer network. And after the multi-layer network is constructed, then we run the um, heat division methods to select the, um, potential biomarkers. So for the different heat division, I use that to do the clustering and to predict for the prediction. So that's the overall um, approach that we use. So um, again, you will see, you can see here, we do the some permutation and some renormalization work and before construct the network. Okay, and after the construction, the network, then do the, um, more analysis. And in this one, because we are looking at the microbial genes, um, so we're looking at the um, cake, cake pathway information and looking at all the metabolites and, uh, and how they link together. So we, that's the multi-layer network we establish from the GNG network and G metabolites network and cake module network through those network. And we undertake the heat um, diffusion and to identify the biomarkers. So um, this work is, um, we are continuing on this work and to look at how we can um, 
how those um, gene in enrichments and the uh, pathway enrichments and analysis can be carried out. So there's still a lot of unknown metabolites in this um, data. Some, as you can see, are known, but there are some are unknown. So that's the key um, research question we want, we need to identify. It. So that's um, finished of those um, applications. And I hope with those four applications, that will give you some idea of how the work that we have been doing and then how possible that um, can be done and hope that you find useful. So then finally, I'm just present just um, just to talk about some tools that we've been used. We have been using Cytoscape a lot in the network and that's a Cytoscape um, inter interface. So it can be used for the network representation and visualization and analysis. It's Java base, okay? And there are also other tools that you can use. And um, the Jeffy tool, that's a non-programming -prog tool that you can use to analyze large network. Because one problem of the cytoscape is when the network is very big and it can take a very long time. And I think um, maybe Joshina or other my other students, sometimes when they run the network, they will do that and leave that in the lab and go home, have, you know, just keep that running for a day or two sometimes even. And the other programmatic solutions for the analysis that you can do programming yourself and you can you and it's one is called iGraph, you can use R, Python, and C, and the other one is called Network X, and you can use Python. And then, of course, you can use MATLAB as well. MATLAB also have some um, tool that you can use, and we use MATLAB sometimes as well. Okay, so to wrap up on the takeaway message, um, the first one is um, just to summarize that um, we have an um, use the network-based approach and which, for my opinion, it's an essential approach in systems biology and biomedicine. And you can apply to various network, single network or multi-layer network or complex network. And you can apply that to a small data set, medium data set or large data set. And you can even extend that to multi-scale. Now I haven't, I didn't have time to go over the multi-scale analysis today, but you can do that for the multi-scale analysis as well. Now we have been applied that to um, those two areas, but it can also be applied to other research areas as well. So for example, um, currently um, we have um, to where well, sense care project already finished, and um, but we have two new um, EU project stop and um, mental and um, manhire. So for the stop project, we look at overweight, obesity, um, prevention of obesity. So you will have data from the different sensors, image, and your lifestyle, etc. And then for the um, manhire project, we look at the mental health. And it was very interesting that and Dr. Um, Harit, Harit Ma and Copra talk about the mental health earlier. So um, this is a project um, we just started this year. And then we look at the mental health. Again, you have the image data, video data, and how you can use that to, defend, to detect effective um, webbing and different data that can be used as well. And the other the other interesting project that um, I'm involved in is the SliceNet project, looking at using 5G, how you being able to control and manage, control the framework so that you can differentiate, you can um, schedule the different, um, different network, network resources. So very interesting. So um, 
Of course, then that's interesting, but it's very challenge. Now we already talked about some challenge in the case study, for example, the construction of the network, how you make sure it's reliable, it's high quality, okay? And then in addition to those, the data, um, big data issue, the high dimensionality, um, heterogeneity of the data, missing, missing value in balanced data, in addition to all those standard big data issue, then when you do the, when you use the network-based approach, how you decide the machine learning model and which one to use and to evaluate the different um, application. And very important, if you use the multi-layer network, how you make sure the coupling mechanism is, um, is correct and how you select that. And very, very difficult, the most difficult one is basically how you being able to incorporate in the domain knowledge into your analysis. Because most of computer science would do um, data-driven data analysis. But nowadays, it's more and more important to incorporate the domain knowledge. But how to incorporate that? It's more, it's, I, to my personal opinion, it's most challenge. Okay, so that's um finish of my um talk today. So I just put in the acknowledgement at the end to acknowledge all the funding bodies um that provide the support to the research. Um, that's my contact information, and so same as and uh, similar as um Dr. Harry Harry. Matt Chopra and uh, Dr. Harry and also um, to Georgina, I would like to extend my invitation to all of you and staff members or students, all of you and in India, if you are very, very welcome to um, visit us, um, of course, when the pandemic is um, gone. And also, I'm really looking forward to the um, collaborations, research collaborations with um, you. And I'm sure that will, there are a lot of um, opportunities that we can work together. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Jane, for your invitation. And we really thank you for your insightful presentation today. It was very interesting and informative creating a stimulating environment for all of us. The slides you showed gave us a close look at the interesting case studies from your research lab. Your results about different research studies were really very fascinating. A big thank you for sharing your time and insights from your interesting studies. Uh, we have some couple of questions for you. Yeah, I just, yeah I just look at, look at the questions here. Yeah, so I think I can read for you. Like, a question was raised that by Arti Goel that which classifier was used or developed here for patient similarity network and ultimately decide disease subtype. Yeah, for the um, for the similarity network, and we use the random work clustering. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Jen, we can hear you, but the sound is a little bit low now. Okay, uh, so for, for the, fine. yeah. Okay, so for that, um, for the, for the similarity one, we you for the disease similarity, we use random, random work, clustering method. And for the um, for the subtype, for the subtype, we use the modularity. Okay, thank you so much, Jane. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Anamika Singh. Uh, please tell few reliable web-based servers for biological network analysis. 
Yeah, I think I, I, at one slice and the final one of the final slides, I've talked about the uh, um, three tools. And I think those three tools will be quite useful to use. And the cytoscape, it's the one that we use most. But in terms of the server, I'm not sure what, um, what you mean about the web-based server. Um, for the analysis, are you thinking of to upload your data to let a server to, are you thinking to upload a data, your data to a server to run that or, or are you thinking of using the web-based tool? If for the tool that we normally use those, you know, three tools. Yes, yeah, centrality. Yes, yeah, centrality major. Yeah, I've seen one. Yes, we do. We do do the centrality. Um, yeah, we do do the centrality analysis. Another question raised was, Jane, which other approaches are being used to explore the biological data? And what are the particular benefits or advantages or disadvantages of network-based approaches? And um, for the biological data um, analysis, there are standard, there are different methods you can use, okay? So to list a few, so, um, normally, when you just started, you can use statistical approach. You can look at the um, regression, uh, sorry, regression model, for example, and then the, you can use that to exploit uh, um, any correlations um, between the data um, to start off to understand the data. After that. And then the standard or the normal, the other machine learning methods you can apply. For example, when you have the data coming, you have different features. Sure. Depends on depends on your data. If your data is um, labeled data, you can use you can apply the classification method directly to that. If the data is unlabeled, of course, you can do the clustering and you can mix them as well. We do. No, don't get me wrong. So although I talk about network-based approach, but we do use um, machine learning um, approach without using network math to exploit the data. For example, in Joshna's um, PhD, I think she used more of machine learning models to look at, and to, she used the logistic um, regression model. She, she looked at, um, other um, random forest, um, machine learning models, et cetera. And I don't think she really use network-based approach. Okay, so it really depends on your research question, your problem. Now for the network-based approach, the key, I th my personal view is um, for the main application for that is when you look at it, it's, when you look at, when you want to exploit the uh, um, relationships or the interactions between the data, then network-based approach is very useful. And the other advantage of that is it's very good to integrate the, the different data into the analysis. So in other machine learning methods, when we try to integrate different method, different data in, we will do the feature um, extraction, feature ranking, et cetera, yeah? Um, and then you try to fusion all the data into one, and then you run to, you go down to do the feature ex extraction, feature ranking, and, and then for the analysis. That's the approach. Um, if you don't use network method, you can use that. But using network 
again, you can still, you will still need to do the feature extraction or feature ranking because you don't want to include those um, redundant feature when you calculate the similarity. But the beauty is then you will be able to see the interaction between two samples. And you will be able to see an uh, overall picture of how the how different data cross the different domain, how they link themselves and how they link cross the data. So um, I think that's the main um, that's the main um, advantage. And I quite like the multi-layer network. And for the multi-layer network, it has one more uh, one more uh, advantage is that it's a, it's give you the scalability and flexibility, so that when you have new data in, you can just you can insert a slice to your network. Okay. So for example, if you only have patients' data for their image. For example, we have um, we have a project on Alzheimer um, disease. So at the beginning, they have the data from the genomics data and have the data from their um, from the protein data, etc. But it didn't have the imaging data information, and so you can st still start to do the multi-layer analysis. And once they have the imaging data. And they will be able to use the image data in and insert, as establish another network and just slice in. And so it's quite um, flexible in that way. I, I hope that answered the question. Oh, thank you so much, Jean. Uh, I think there is one question regarding, do you recommend any methods to deal with the compositional nature of biological data and in analysis? <laughs> yeah, and the, the method we, we use now, we use the permutation method. So we try, we try to look at the different measurements of the um, similarity measurement. So that's the method we, we use. Um, I, again, I think it really depends on the. Um, it really de depends. It really depends on your on the question. It's hard to say which method to recommend, but I would say, um, looking at permutation, it's always a good idea. Oh, thank you so much, Jane. Uh, a question from Sheetal Taneja that are the subtypes identified in conformance to the subtypes identified in literature or they are different? The, I think the subtypes that you have shared that have yes. been identified, are they similar or in conformance to some subtypes that have been identified in the literature or they are the new ones? Yeah, that's, um, thank you for the question. I didn't put up the that um, comparison result to my slides. Um, that's a really that's really a very good question. Okay, so for the same data set we use, there are two other research work um try to identify the subtypes. So one research work identified um three subtypes, the other research work identified four subtypes. Okay. Now it's hard to say. It's hard to say it, how many subtypes is better. Is that three or four? It's better, and um, we can apply different measurements to say to say that. But in reality, it's hard to to say, say which one is better. But it's very interesting when we look at we compare our results with their results. Um. For the one with the three um, subtypes, and compared to the one we identified, there are some interesting of overlapping, and also some interesting of um, some interesting observation of difference. 
And so from that, same is the one that we, um, it's looking at the different angle or different aspects of the conditions, okay? So the one, the three subtypes we identify compare with these other three subtypes, one subtypes are more, more or less the same, but the other two are slightly different. And um, we think, we think, um, apply for other measurements within our our results it's it's more reliable now compare the compare of our result of three subtype with those four subtypes it's very interesting it looks like um two of our subtypes are mapped with the the two subtypes they already identified but the other one seems split into the other two. So there are some overlapping, put that this way. So there are some overlapping. And um, but the most interesting thing is about the the the, the reason we, we said the one we identify is more interesting or more meaningful is for the treatment result, the one we identify has very clear difference. So that's I think that's more um, promising. Oh, thank you so much, Jane. Uh, so a link for feedback form is shared in the chat box for the participants. We would love to hear back from you and request all the participants to please kindly fill the feedback form. So here we come to the end of our session. Sincere apologies to all that Dr. Haitma Chopra, the principal of the college, had to leave to join some other urgent meeting. But I thank everybody for joining us today. And we have a privilege that Dr. Naveen, Professor Naveen Kumar from Department of Computer Science is here with us. So I, I would like to invite him to say a few words. Welcome, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon, please. Uh, I yes, you thank you, Professor Jain, for such an interesting presentation on the multi-layer network analysis. The applications that you are working on and you have presented in this session, I'm sure would surely uh, stimulate a lot of interest in the subject at our university and elsewhere, as I see some of the participants from different organizations. We do look forward to significant collaborations. And I also take this opportunity to invite you for a personal visit to our university as and when it is feasible and convenient. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. And do also hope you will be able to, to visit us soon. Surely. Thank you, Professor Jim. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's um, webinar. Thank you. Uh I thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much, Professor Jane and Professor Naveen Kumar. I extend my sincere gratitude to you both. A huge thanks to all the participants and the, my colleagues from the university and members of the organizing committee from Department of Computer Science Maitri College, Dr. Manju Bharatwaj, Dr. Veena Guriani, Ms. Shikha Badhani, Ms. Rupali Ahuja and Mr. Abhishek Khurana. The webinar was impossible without support of you all. So I really hope that all the participants have enjoyed this session. Thanks again for making this even so rewarding. And at the last, we say stay safe and stay happy, everyone. Take care and thank you so much. Kindly fill the feedback form before uh, leaving the chat. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much, Professor Jane and Professor Naveen Kumar. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs>